What's up guys? Welcome back to Newswave. So it looks like we have something else to look forward to this week as Summer Game Fest is getting some other event showcase. Uh, we're going to go over that here today. Also, Ubisoft announced that we would have something to look forward to this summer, which kind of sounds like what they were going to do at E3, but I, I guess they're just going to do it themselves, it seems. And then we had some controversy hit Assassin's Creed Valhalla on the Xbox Series X. We'll go over that. And then it looks like a cartridge popped up on eBay for $130,000. We're going to talk a bit about why that is here as well. As always, guys, if you enjoy these videos, make sure that like button helps out a ton. If you're brand new here, hit that red subscribe button down below as we head towards 500,000 subscribers. And we're going to start today with Star Wars Episode One Racer. It's a game I'm, I've been looking forward to because I really enjoyed it back on the Nintendo 64. And Aspire is working, of course, to port the game over to the Switch and the PlayStation 4. But they seem to be running into some problems that's caused a couple of delays now with the latest one being seemingly indefinite. Basically, they're not really sure when it's going to be coming out now, and this is what they said. We are so excited to share Star Wars Episode One Racer with you soon. Unfortunately, due to the ongoing work from home requirements across the industry, the game will be further delayed on Nintendo Switch and PlayStation 4. We'll be back with an update as soon as possible. This, according to them, appears to be from some of the working at home, remote work, not necessarily uh, making things any easier to get to deadlines and get stuff done. Now, looking at this, I don't know if this is going to be like a massive delay. I mean, it, it really, it's hard to say, obviously, from the outside, since none of us are at the studio working with them or any of that, but the PlayStation 4 version, I believe, already got pushed to, like, the end of this month, and the Switch version was supposed to come out today, so I'm kind of hoping that maybe by the end of this month, the Switch version and the PlayStation 4 version will at least have release dates kind of set in stone, but it's really hard to say. Uncertain times, obviously, right now for a lot of studios, so we'll see. Hopefully it's not too much longer, though, for Star Wars Episode One Racer, because while it is an older game that's being cleaned up for current platforms, so it's not going to look necessarily amazing, it is a lot of fun. Also, we had some strange stuff going on around Elder Scrolls Blades, and uh, look, we've, we've seen Elder Scrolls Blades from Bethesda before, where they showed it off as kind of like this free-to-play mobile type game. Uh, of course, they have microtransactions attached to it. It's a free-to-play game. I give it a bit more leeway when it's not a full $60 game and then microtransactions. But the game itself, to me, didn't look that great. And once they said it was mostly going to be geared at the time towards cell phones, then eventually looked towards platforms, I said, okay, well, at least that, that makes some sense to me anyway. But it appears to be heading to the Switch this week. Originally, Nintendo posted it then took it down. Now it's appeared on the eShop, as you can see here, as people started to spot it. In fact, you can go there now and see for yourself. It appears to be launching May 14th, and they also have a starter pack that you can buy. They even have it bundled where you just get the free download and then the starter pack, and that appears to be $14.99. Of course, you can also just download it and try it out. I mean, that's the one really good thing or big benefit, I should say, for these free-to-play games. You just try it, and hey, if you don't like it, you just delete it. Like, it's not even that big of a file. I think it's just over a gigabyte or something. So it won't even take too long to download. You can try it out. If it's if you don't think it's good and it's terrible, you can just delete it. But hey, Elder Scrolls Blades, if you've been wondering where it is, it's about two days out. Oh, and while we're on the topic of Elder Scrolls, Elder Scrolls VI has continued to come up, of course, as we're in this weird year of 2020 where I guess Bethesda will have their own thing even as well. And people on Twitter keep asking Bethesda and, and even Pete Hines, hey, what happened to Elder Scrolls 6? Is that coming anytime soon? Most of us think it's going to be a while, and Pete Hines took to Twitter, as you're seeing here, saying it's after Starfield, which you pretty much know nothing about, so if you're coming at me for details now and not years from now, I'm failing to properly manage your expectations. Yeah, Starfield will probably be out in the next, I would say, two years or so. I think once they really show it, it'll be coming out, like, later that year or, like, earlier the following year. So uh, that would probably mean that Elder Scrolls VI is indeed, like, three or four <laughs> years away, they showed that super, super early, probably just to let people know, hey, we didn't forget about this. Sure, we did Skyrim, and we continue to port that all over the place, but we're still working on Elder Scrolls Six. Although, I'll be honest, I am very interested in Starfield since it's a bit of a departure for, obviously, like something like Elder Scrolls, which we kind of know to expect. 
I, I don't really know at all what to expect from Starfield, so right now, I am more interested in Starfield, but, I mean, it's Elder Scrolls, so obviously there's a lot of excitement around it. And guys, with some of the quick news out of the way, let's get into the bigger stuff. We're going to start right away with some of the events that uh, have been announced we can start looking forward to. One, of course, being Ubisoft. They decided to announce that they would be holding their own digital presentation, which they usually would do, obviously, at E3. They'd kind of have their own time slot. They'd have a, a live crowd there, a stage, and they would show games off and walk people or celebrities or whoever up and kind of talk about the game or even have a whole dance number that would get most of us who stream the thing struck down and then we can't live stream pretty much anything else and of course Ubisoft was earlier in the week so we missed out on all kinds of stuff right it's happened every year so I will not be streaming the Ubisoft presentation this year and uh oh well sure I, I guess I'll miss out on on some of those amazing games although I, maybe this year could be their year when it comes to this stuff. Last year wasn't as great, but here's what they tweeted out saying, save the date, join us July 12th for Ubisoft Forward, a fully digital showcase and with exclusive game news, reveals, and more. Stay tuned. So obviously we're going to be looking for Assassin's Creed Valhalla gameplay, hopefully more than the three seconds that they showed at the Series X event. That would be a good start, I, I think. And then, of course, updates on their other projects like Watchdogs, like, uh, psh, that disappeared, right? It seemed like there were some issues going on in the background with development, and maybe they had to move it more or less to next-gen consoles, and that might have tripped them up a bit. It's, uh, it's gonna be interesting when that thing does resurface and we see if it's basically the same game, or maybe they change some stuff up. Gods and Monsters was another one that also kind of disappeared, and I'm hoping that we get something out of left field, like a uh, Mario Rabbids 2. That would be really, really cool, or... Maybe they do another collab with Nintendo and kind of build off of what they've done uh, before with Starlink. Maybe they just full on do a Star Fox game. That would be pretty awesome. Otherwise though, of course, Prince of Persia, Splinter Cell. I mean, we'll probably get some kind of update on Rainbow Six, for example, and others that are pretty straightforward, I think there. But I'm hoping for some kind of like Curveball or a Wild Card, something crazy that they throw out there that gets people really, really excited. And I'm sure there's some stuff that might not be massive to everyone, but like a Rayman, that would be pretty cool, right? So I'm hoping Ubisoft step backs and looks at what they've done previously with their Ubisoft formula and just tries to change it up a little bit, right? Maybe they show another Far Cry and it looks like Far Cry, but like something else you throw in there that's just off the wall and weird and different would be really, really cool. But look forward to July, and I think we're gonna continue getting announcements from companies to where we basically have an entire summer of events to look forward to. And you know what? I think I think I actually am starting to prefer this a bit more, where we have a spread out number of events for these different companies, and that way we can spend more time kind of talking about what they've done there for like the week or two afterwards, rather than have all of these events piled on top of each other in the span of like five days at E3. Next up, let's talk about the other event that was announced yesterday, and we don't have to wait too much longer for that, because as for the Summer Game Fest. Now, Jeff Keighley, of course, is running this very long uh, event, seems that it's gonna be like from what May to August, but there'll be a ton of things in there to look forward to. And they decided to make their second announcement after the announcement that's coming today, it seems. But they wanted to line us up with this tweet, as you can see here. It says, just announced a Summer Game Fest special event. Tune in Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific for a special Summer Game Fest showcase and interview, which is very interesting that we'd be getting not only a showcase, but also an interview, which... I assume that means they're gonna have a a setup. Maybe it really is just over like uh, like Skype or Zoom or something. Or maybe they decided to, to do like a little sit down. That would be that would be kind of neat. But a showcase to me sounds like gameplay, right? For whatever it is they're showing. Let's say it's a new game that we haven't seen before, and they decide to show off like ten minutes of gameplay, and then they also kind of talk about the game over that gameplay. That would be pretty awesome. That's that would be uh, if if the game is is interesting enough and exciting enough, I think people would really get into that. My only concern is that for these Summer Game Fest announcements is that people get really, really hyped and, and then we get kind of let down as to how big these uh, these announcements are, of course. Expectations get up there and you start like hoping for crazy stuff, Mother 3 or something, right? And then it's like just uh, like indie games or something that could be cool, but don't really bring the hype factor that something really, really big would. Now, I will say, 
I think Jeff Keighley is going to be showing some next generation games at Summer Game Fest, obviously, as he's even been pretty vocal on Twitter at times about articles that seem to criticize the differences in visuals between the Xbox One X and the Series X being pretty small, or even pointing out next-gen like the PS5, even going as far as to say that IGN's own article about next-gen not looking that much different probably won't age very well. And I have to agree with him, actually, on that. I think... I think you're gonna see some pretty cool things from first parties. I think Sony's gonna show off some wild stuff that, that's really gonna make you think about that jump to next gen, and Microsoft probably will also with their first party stuff that they'll be showing in July. But we have something to look forward to later on today that is apparently a fun announcement, and I'm, I think I'm, I'm looking forward to that one. And then we have something tomorrow on Wednesday, and then who knows what else this week holds for us. And I'm starting to think this actually might be a pretty fun week. Definitely more so than I thought, let's say on like Saturday or Sunday. Next up, let's talk about Assassin's Creed Valhalla on the Xbox Series X. Going into next generation, there are a lot of expectations around not only how the games will look, but also the performance level specifically, frame rate. We've had some, we'll say choppy games at times this generation as the companies tried to push more or less towards that resolution and just the overall look of the game. But as we've heard of these massive upgrades, whether it's the SSD, CPU, or of course the GPU, people are expecting some pretty big things. So when we uh, find out that Assassin's Creed will apparently be running at at least 4K, 30 frames per second on next generation platforms, it has not gone over very well online. Now this was in a statement from Ubisoft confirming to Eurogamer Portugal saying, currently we can guarantee that Assassin's Creed Valhalla will run at at least 30 frames per second. Assassin's Creed Valhalla will benefit from faster loading times, allowing players to immerse themselves in history and the world without friction. Finally, Assassin's Creed Valhalla will benefit from improved graphics made possible by the Xbox Series X, and we can't wait to see the beautiful world we're creating in stunning 4K resolution. Now, keep in mind, we've of course been told, uh, I believe it was, yes, it was by Ubisoft, that the 30 frames per second is more cinematic, right? That was, that was a big push uh, there. I prefer the games to be 60 frames, even if we have to lose some of that resolution or some of that extra shine off of a surface. You know what, it, performance? I think is key when it comes to any game at this point. I think 60 frames is probably what most companies should hopefully move towards, but I, I can guarantee you some of these bigger companies, AAA, third party, or third party companies are going to look at this and say, well, we can look, make this game look amazing, but it's gonna be like 40 frames per second. So let's just cap it at 30. That's playable, and we'll let them uh, kind of go through it there. I think it'd be better if we had options where it's like, oh, the game might not look as good, but the frame rate would be better, a performance mode, right? Or you just uncap the frame rate and let us go wild, and if we don't like it, we can just cap it at 30 and kind of go from there. For a lot of people though, 30 frames per second is enough, like for the vast majority of people out there, and I get that. And I mean, realistically, let's be, let's be honest here, visuals do help to sell a game big time to a mass audience because you'll run commercials with it and it'll look really, really good when they first see it. And they will be less likely to talk about the frame rate as opposed to how good the overall world around you and the character models look. So it is a shame to hear that it could just be 30 frames per second on next gen platforms, all the expectations and the hype leading up to it. But I mean, let's see the game in motion. Let's see just how good it looks. And from there, we can then kind of judge if they made the right decision. And in our last bit of news, let's talk about a cartridge that has now appeared on eBay for $130,000. You can see the listing here. Uh, it's a Nintendo World Championships 1990 gray NES competition cartridge. It appears to have been graded with a rating of six. That would be out of 10. And it is a $129,999.99. And it is like $10 shipping. I don't know why. I don't know why you would charge for shipping if the thing is already $130,000. You feel like you get to that point and you say, you know what? I'll cover the shipping. It's fine. But there it is. Now, Nintendo World Championship cartridges are, of course, a thing of legend. It's like uh, most, a lot of collectors would say, like, holy grail. There is the gray version. Then there's the gold version with a little sticker on it. Uh, but it is interesting to see this pop up on eBay for $130,000 after it's been graded. I think there is a lot of value that's put into something being graded because that means it would then be covered and authentic and it would be verified. But like at 130,000 is quite a bit. We had one recently that was discovered. 
I think last year it was done with the Pink Gorilla where they managed to have one come in and they set up what was a private sale. I know Metal Jesus Rocks did a video on it. And after going through the sale in the comments section, he mentioned that it sold for $23,000. It was up to a private set or private buyer from the seller. So like we've gone from 23,000 all the way up to $130,000. Now they're also accepting offers, but I can't imagine it's terribly low from that. So I don't know if this is someone who had bought it on the high end and is looking to make some money on it after realizing that they're not really gonna do a ton with it or just their local, cause this does appear to be a store, their local, I guess, uh, customer base isn't gonna really be buying it, so they just throw it up on eBay. I, it, It's weird to me to see it that much. I didn't think it was worth anywhere near that amount currently, but hey, if, if no one buys it, it'll just come back down and maybe they'll lower the price from there. It's gonna be more of a story, I think, if someone actually buys it for $130,000. But hey, maybe I'm missing something here. If you look at this listing and you spot something as to why it's $130,000, let me know in the comments down below. Oh, also a fun fact, while I was looking on eBay at this cartridge, I noticed that even the authentic shirts from the 1990 Nintendo World Championships are about $500. So uh, yeah, the 90s are just an expensive time. And we'll finish up with the comment of the day as you're seeing here. This is from Keith saying, heard Microsoft is waiting to announce price of console to undercut Sony. Makes me wonder if there will be an even cheaper console or Microsoft is just desperate to do good next gen and willing to lose as much on the console as they have to. So I, I do think looking at this, I think Microsoft would like to really hit Sony hard and seriously just show up and, and let them announce the price and then say, oh yeah, we're gonna, we're in the same price as the Series X, but we also have Lockhart and that's $300. So that's just $200 cheaper straight up and it plays the same games. I, I think Microsoft still remembers how Sony just showed up and straight up caught them off guard with the PlayStation 4. So maybe they wanna return the favor, but if Sony's waiting for Microsoft to show the price and Microsoft's waiting for Sony to show the price, like, Eventually someone's just gonna have to show the price. So I'll be curious which company just ends up just like, just straight up putting the price out there and just hoping for the best from the competition and what they do. So we'll see. And ladies and gentlemen, that's gonna do it here for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit that like button, it really helps out. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything we talked about today, where there's that NES cartridge that popped up on eBay for $130,000, graded by the way, so you're probably not gonna be playing it. Let me know what you think about that pricing there. And then also what about Ubisoft's event or the Summer Game Fest stuff that seems to be kind of picking up right now. Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you next time.